The autumn months are some of the best for running, or to train for running. The weather is a little cooler, and there are several running events, like the Maple Leaf Half Marathon here in Manchester, which took place in early September. As part of an occasional series on health and ideas for getting some physical exercise to maintain conditioning and general overall health, we turn to running, and Dr. Rebecca Breslow, a running coach who operates a business, Running Health Vermont, where she coaches individual runners to help them get the most out of their running routines. She also coaches the Burn Burton Academy cross-country running team. We met up with her and one of her clients, Christina Denosi, at the running track at the Dana Thompson Recreation Park in Manchester to go over some pointers that ordinary, regular runners can use to up their game and shave some time off the time clock the next time they go out for a marathon, or half marathon, or 5K, or just for a training run. All right, so hello viewers. I'm Dr. Rebecca Breslow, and this is Christina Denosi. Hey. And uh, we are gonna talk to you today about running injuries. And the reason that this is a great time of year to be talking about that is that there are lots of fall races that people have on their calendars. And so we wanna make sure that we give you some tips um, for how to stay healthy while you're training for a fall race. Um, so I'm a sports med doctor, I'm also a coach, and I own a business called Running Health Vermont here in Manchester, and I coach runners. And um, Christina has been working with me for a couple of months now, mm -hmm. and she's actually going to be running a marathon in mid-October. And she actually just ran the Maple Leaf Half Marathon here in town, and she was the third woman, so I'm very proud of her. <laughs> She's a great runner. She has been running for a long time, um, but just has some goals of taking her running up to the next level. And so that's what I've been working with her on. So um, I, one of the uh, issues runners face frequently is injuries or overcoming injuries. Uh, what are some of the tips or ideas that you have, Dr. Breslow, on how runners can avoid injuries or recover from them if they have them? So, you know, obviously this is a huge topic and it's very individualized, but I think, you know, one thing that I always really encourage people to do is before you have a race on the calendar, spend time building up a really solid running base. Um, so, for example, in Christina's case, she runs year round pretty much every day. And so when I started working with her, she was already running at a base of about 25 to 30 yeah. miles a week. Is that about right? right? Yeah. And so that is a very easy person to work with because she has already, you know, gotten through that ramp up period, which is the period when you're most vulnerable to injuries. And I don't know if you've had times when you've had injuries and then have had to ramp back up and if it's been difficult. Not in running. I've had a lucky 10-ish years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is very lucky yeah <laughs> um, because most people um, you know the period of time when they're trying to build their running base is the time that they're most vulnerable to injuries because you really have to get used to running um, it, it's not an easy thing to do it's it can be very hard on the body and so taking the time to build a base without a race on the calendar is a great way to reduce your risk of injuries um, because then when you add more specific training like speed workouts or things that are or longer runs that are going to get you performing well in your target race distance um, you already have that foundation to work off of so i would say that's one thing um, another thing that you can do is you can optimize your running form and you know everyone is a little bit different everyone is going to run in their individual ways and we can sort of get to this a little bit later in the segment and I can show you some things that I look for when I'm evaluating a runner's form but you know there are asymmetries that can be addressed um, generally away from running with things like strength training or mobility work um, there are things like stride rate or how fast you step where we can tweak that to help you absorb ground forces a little bit more successfully. Um, you know, all sorts of different things with the running form. There are drills you can do to work on different pieces of the running stride. 
and making yourself as symmetrical as possible, improving these things helps a lot because running is a repetitive motion uh, activity. You are stepping over thousands and thousands of steps. And so if you have these little asymmetries, a lot of which can't actually be seen with the naked eye, um, that can lead to, those imbalances can lead to running injuries. So that's another thing. And then I would say the third thing to really reduce your injury risk is to do things around running that complement your running. So like, for example, Christina's really good about being on the foam roller. She's got a massage gun. So when she has things that are tight, that she's noticing or talking to her, she'll work on it herself. And that's incredibly empowering to know, okay, you know, my right hamstring is bothering me. I'm gonna spend some time on the foam roller. I'm gonna spend some time stretching to work that out so that when I go to run, you know, I've addressed that. Um, and also, she does quite a bit of strength training in addition to her running. And not all of it is weights in the, in the gym. She does do some lifting in the gym, but a lot of it is just body weight exercises to work on core stability, hip stability that you can do in 10, 15 minutes after a run or as a standalone workout. And those are things that um, you know can really help support your running. And what are some of the most common injuries that runners can sustain or I see, so for newer runners, I see a lot of shin splints, which is pain either in the inside of the shin or the outside of the shin. Um, knee injuries are quite common, particularly pain around the front of the knee, which is colloquially called runner's knee. Um, this, the medical term is patellofemoral syndrome. And then um, iliotibial band, pain on the outside of the knee is very common. Uh, many runners have tight calves and pain in their Achilles, uh, things like plantar fasciitis, which is pain on the bottom of the feet, r around the foot arch, um, and then hip pain, low back pain. I mean, you name it. <laughs> There's a lot of, uh, a lot that can talk to you when you're a regular runner. So, Christina, have you ever had to work your way out of an injury of some sort, or? Uh, not in running, but... In used to play tennis and certainly had some of that IT band pain that Rebecca mentioned on the outside of my knees. So did a lot of knee mobility, some stability exercises, your really basic squats and everything. Just to, same, same type of thing to get back up into running shape again. Well, do we want to have Christina demonstrate some of these yeah, techniques yeah, you were referring to there? Absolutely. So, you know, I have um, some, some things that I look at just, um, I have my clipboard here because generally when I evaluate a runner, I will make some notes. Um, so I will demonstrate some of the things I look at. Um, so first I'm just going to look at Christina and what her standing posture is like. So maybe we'll take a little space out here on the track and I can just show you guys. So, um, so if she turns and faces me, you know, and actually I frequently like to do this without shoes. So uh, I don't know if you want to, yeah. So um, if you don't mind maybe <laughs> taking your shoes yeah. off and while she's doing that, I can say that um, footwear is actually something that I t always talk to runners about because it's very important to um, have the appropriate footwear for your foot. And so um, you know, you want to make sure if you're running very regularly that you're keeping track of approximately how many miles you have on your sneakers. Um, because if you've run about 300 to 500 miles in a pair of shoes, the cushioning gets worn down. They don't keep their shape as well. Um, and so, you know, they, they will not be giving you the foot support that you need. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. And then another thing to really keep in mind with footwear is, you know, there's a lot of different types of trainers. So there are some trainers that have a lot of cushioning. There are some trainers that are more minimal in the cushioning. There are some sneakers where your heel to toe differential, which basically if you can envision that this is your foot, some sneakers will hold your foot more of a, a plantar flexed position, which is like this. Others have less of a heel toe differential and they will hold um, your foot in a more natural, neutral position. And so um, if you are accustomed to running in a particular type of shoe, 
and you want to transition to a different type of shoe, it's important to do that transition gradually and to make sure that you're not going from a shoe that holds you like this to a shoe that holds you like this too quickly because that's a situation where, again, when repeated over thousands of steps, um, you know, that quick of a change is gonna, your body's gonna feel that and your calves are gonna bother you, your feet are gonna bother you, maybe your knees, that sort of thing. Um, so just looking at Christina, you know, I can see that she um, does have a little bit of a, a what's called overpronation, which is her foot arches collapse a bit. And Christina, you wear inserts. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So talk talk to us a little bit about your sneakers and what works for you. Yeah. So the the inserts do give me some arch support, um, and also kind of support maybe under the toes. I don't know if you guys have. There's been a lot of talk about barefoot running and. I think one thing that orthotics kind of give me is like if you're really running barefoot in you know the leaves and the, and, and the woods you'd have kind of some like stuff under your feet and those little grooves that kind of exist and so orthotics fill that gap for me um, they make me stand up a little bit better my legs certainly like I know that they collapse in if I'm just standing around so they give me the support I need to be able to run a more efficient stride um, gets rid of my my foot pain and knee pain yeah they've been really helpful yeah and I think that's a good point about the barefoot running. You know, I think barefoot running can be a great tool to help strengthen feet. And sometimes with some runners, I will have them take their shoes off and do a lap on the infield barefoot or do some strides, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit, or drills barefoot for foot strengthening. But it's pretty hard to do a lot of barefoot running. You have to transition to that over a very long period of time and not everybody has the foot structure to do it. Um, so that's another thing to be careful about. If you are going to incorporate barefoot running, you want to make sure you use it as a training tool, but for most people, it's not going to be the way that they can run all the time. Um, so a couple of things that I look at too is how well someone can stand on one leg. So Christina, if you're, if you don't have good balance doing this, that's okay. That's just okay. information. So, you know, Christina's standing on one leg and then I'm going to ask her to do single leg squat and you don't have to go all the way down, maybe just about, you know, yeah, there you go. So what I'm looking at is, you know, when she does that, and you can do that again, you know, A, how good is her balance? B, does her knee track over the middle of her foot, which she's doing a pretty good job. You can see it sort of caves a little bit. And then C, how, how level are her hips? And you can see that they're pretty level, but she does have a little bit of a, um, you know, hip hike on that right side. And then let's compare what she looks like on the other side. You know, and to me, that side looks a little bit more stable than the other side. I How are you feel? Surgery on the other side. Yeah. So there you so go. That's, that's residual. Yeah. So, you know, having her do a simple, that's great, Christina, okay. thank you. Having her do a simple motion like that, you know, can give me a lot of information about, well, you know, what strength training do I need to recommend? And for her, if her left is a little bit less strong or a little bit less stable than her right, you know, I might direct her to do a little bit more strengthening on that left side so that things even out. Um, so that's the sort of thing that I that I look at as well. And then I'll look at things like flexibility. So I'll ask you to touch your toes. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's great. A lot of runners actually can't do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, she's, she's flexible. Yeah, I work so on she's it, though. quite fre flexible. flexible. Yeah, and then I'll have you turn around and face away from us. And then keeping your feet facing forward just with your upper body and your hips and your shoulders kind of twist towards me it doesn't matter which direction i'm going to ask you to do both so that's good that's great thoracic spine mobility good hip mobility and then go ahead the other side good and again to, you know to me twist to the left again to me that looks a little bit easier for you yeah. than over to the right you know, so again, that may be, there are a variety of reasons why that could happen. She could have some soft tissue tightness on that side. Um, she could have, uh, you know, some uh, soft tissue tightness in the muscles around her spine. So, you know, those are little easy 
easy tweaks that can then direct me, well, you know, I might need her to do a little bit more work before she runs on that hip that doesn't have as good mobility as the other one. So, um, all right. So those, there are a lot of standing tests that we can do, but uh, we probably will want to get to running. So if you want to put your sneakers back on. Yeah, no barefoot running for me, please. No barefoot running today, no. anyway. Darn. I, might, I might make you do that another day. <laughs> <laughs> Look at your running log. And actually, that's while she's putting on her sneakers. Um, that's another thing that I'll mention is that whether or not you're working on your own to train for, for a race or even just to build up your running um, or with a coach, it's a really great idea to keep a log. Um, you know, you want to note things like what you did that day, how you felt, how tired you felt, if any of your um, body parts were hurting. Um, you know, you can even no sort of mark what I was talking about with the sneakers when you start a new pair of sneakers so you can keep track of how many miles you have on sneakers. You can write down things like nutrition. So one of the things Christina and I have been experimenting with is how to make it easier for her to take nutrition during races because she likes to run long distance marathon and ultra marathon type races. And when you're running such long distances, you do actually need to refuel while you're running and that can be difficult for people. So, you know, those are all little details that can be recorded in a log that are very helpful. All right, so let's right. go over to the track and I'm actually gonna, going to grab my phone and I'm not gonna tell Christina why I'm grabbing my phone because I don't want to make her um, self-conscious about okay. why I have it. So I'm gonna actually just ask her to do okay. is just run a slow, easy pace around the track and let's see what you look like. Okay. Okay? All right. And I'll kind of narrate while she's running. So, you know, one of the things that, I, that jumps out at me right off the bat is looking at her arm swing. And even though when you're running, you're, you're using your lower body, you are, um, your upper body really affects your lower body. And so you might have been able to see when she was running away from us, that she carried her right arm very different than her left arm. And she actually um, moves her right arm a lot more than she moves her left arm. And so that sort of detail that I can see right away is going to affect her running stride down below. And that may have something to do with some of the asymmetries we saw when she was just standing. Um, you know, frequently, you think that asymmetries in arm swing are due to things that are actually going on with the arm and shoulders, but a lot of time what's happening is that it's um, whether or not the core muscles are activating the way they need to in order to stabilize you when you're running. Um, so those are things that now that I see this with Christina, she, you know, she's extremely athletic and she already is coming with a great running base. So um, when you're, coming to me with that sort of background you're going to be able to withstand injuries a lot better and she really hasn't had very many running injuries in spite of running a lot um, so let's watch her again coming towards us and again you know you can really see um, that difference in her arm carriage so that's one thing that I'm gonna look at with this lap all right, excellent. So we're gonna ask you to keep going if you want to. <laughs> okay. All right, so another thing that I look at is stride rate, okay? So the optimal stride rate is about 170 to 180 strides per minute. So I have a metronome app on my phone, which is why I was bringing that out. And I'm looking to see, is she stepping at about that rate? So she's stepping I have it set now to about 170 strides per minute, and that's about what she's stepping. And what I can see that correlates that is when she lands, when her foot lands on the track, she is landing pretty well beneath her center of mass. Um, and the reason why that's important is because a lot of people who have knee pain, shin splints, those sorts of things, um, they are, instead of stepping directly underneath their center of mass, they are actually stepping in front of their center of mass. And that is a much more impactful way to run. So when I have a runner 
who, you know, Christina looks like she is already stepping at a, at a good rapid stride rate and that's resulting in a good center of mass, but um, foot strike. But if she was running with a slower stride rate and striking ahead of her center of mass, I might say to her, um, you know, let's have you run with a metronome and a minute in every mile, practice stepping at 170 strides per minute, practice stepping at 175. Um, so when she comes back, I'll tell her some of the, the observations. All right, so we've been chatting about you <laughs> and some of the things we've noticed. So the thing we were just talking about and the reason why I had my metronome app out is because I wanted to see what your stride rate I was. knew that that's what you were doing. Yeah, <laughs> and actually you run at a, a very good stride rate. So I had it set to 170 strides per minute. Sounds all right. What I was telling Andrew is that optimal is 170 to 180 strides per minute. And by the way, that is regardless of how fast you're running. So some people might think, well, in order to run faster, I need to step quicker, but you actually also need to step quite quickly, even when you're running slowly. And the way you get more speed is the amount of power you put behind your steps. So one good benefit of you running at a nice quick stride rate is that when I see your foot strike, you are striking pretty well beneath your center mm. of mass. And I was explaining to Andrew that that's important because if you strike ahead of your center of mass, you're kind of breaking yourself at yeah. every stride and that's a very high impact way to run. And so Brian I'm Dunn, happy to see, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly right. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there is some talk about whether or not it's best to run with a heel strike or a midfoot strike or a forefoot strike. And really any of those are fine as long as you're, you're stepping beneath your center of mass. Mm -hmm. I think one thing people who try to run primarily with a forefoot strike run into is that that is a very difficult way to run. It's a lot of strain on your calf muscles, a lot of strain on your quad muscles. And if you never put your heel down, you have a very difficult time activating your gluteal muscles. And especially some of these side stabilizing gluteal muscles, those are very important for keeping your hip stable and your core stable. Um, and so, you know, forefoot running can be tricky. Again, if you're gonna take off your shoes and do a lap around the infield barefoot, you're gonna run forefoot because you're not gonna heel strike if you're running barefoot. Um, but for, for most people, a midfoot strike is, is a, a good, you know, safe way to go. But even if you have a little bit of a heel strike, that's okay too. Um, so the major thing I, that I was noticing about you is that you have some asymmetry with the way your mm. arm swing is. I don't know if you've been told this before. I have one dinosaur arm. Kind of yeah. Just goes behind me a little. Yeah, yeah. So you actually wind up swinging your right arm quite a bit more and holding it closer to your body. And your left arm is mm -hmm. kind of out like this a little bit and doesn't move uh, as much. <laughs> and what I was explaining to Andrew is that that actually probably has less to do with your arms and your shoulders than with your core strength. Mm, um, and fair. so one of the things that this has me thinking of now, you know, again, and this isn't something that we're going to do in the next few weeks yeah. because you have a marathon in three weeks. Yeah. So we're not going to make any sweeping adjustments. But after your marathon, we're going to take a couple of weeks to recover from the marathon. And that may be a really good time to include some tailored exercises to help you activate your core on that left side yep. and particularly your side stabilizing core muscles not not your big six-pack core muscles because yeah, i know you have guys. that but the little guys yeah. yeah because they may be strong but if they're not working in the right combination with some of your other stabilizing muscles while you run that then that over time you know not now because you're young and healthy and athletic and you run a lot but over time that could be an issue for you mm -hmm. so um to preempt that i would want to address that and some of your hip mobility um yes. away from running when you're recovering from your marathon okay yeah um all right so let's see what are some other things i wanted to tell you guys about um 
one thing that we can do and one of the things that I've added into Christina's program that I think you think are really fun that most people do are the drills. Yeah, I like the yeah. drills. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, even distance runners need to do running drills. And running drills are um, activities that you can do. You can use them as a warm up. You can you can throw them into a run to vary the way you're stepping. Um, you can use them to specifically work on running biomechanics, but they are things that accentuate a specific um, phase of the running stride and help you work on that phase of the running stride. So let's go into the infield and you can um, demonstrate some of the drills that I've been having you do. And I usually have you do these a couple times a week. And then, uh, you know, sometimes just with an easy run and then sometimes as a warm up to a, a, a workout. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't you, um, I see I'm trying to find the go. best camera angle. You probably want Andrew, you probably want to be there, and I, go there. I can go there. Okay. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and show us butt kicks? Uh huh. All right. So this is emphasizing the follow-through phase. Yep. Yeah. Come on back. Okay. So she looks really good with her lower body, but I'm going to be a little bit picky about her upper body and I'm going to tell her that I want her to pretend like she's squeezing a clementine orange in the crook of her arm because I want her, I don't want any of this action, I don't want her holding her arms like this, I want her holding her arms like this and I'm going to ask her to think about using the muscles in the back of her arm when she's doing those butt kicks. Okay. okay, and it doesn't matter how far you travel. Okay, um, it's more the quick turnover and the good position, good form. All right, okay. so go ahead. All right, so squeeze that. Yeah, that's better. Now coming back with that left arm, squeeze that orange in the. Yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. Good. All right. So that looks, that looks really good. All right, what is, I wrote down the ones I put in your workout today. Oh, okay, so A skips. All right, okay, so A let's skips. see your A skips. Okay. So that looks really good, okay? okay. But I'm gonna tell you the same thing. So you want to really be thinking about your arms, you want to be thinking about your feet dorsiflexed, okay. okay? So let's give it another go. Okay. So again, try one more time, but not, none of this, okay? <laughs> Until they're down there. Yep, so we're just we're doing, okay. Yeah, better. Okay. Okay? Yeah. All right, so have we done B-skips? Those ones that you kick out. Yeah, yeah. so let's see what the B-skips look like. Okay. I'll like pay attention to my arms. Yeah. Yeah, better. All right, so both of these drills are working on the swing phase, okay? So you can see that the A-skips, she was just working on the swing phase. And now with the B skips, she's working a little bit on that paw back motion, which is going to give her more power. Okay. Um, so karaoke is another one we like to do our grapevine. Mm -hmm. um, and we like to do that. That's a lateral one because a lot of running is in this front and back sagittal plane. Yeah. But the muscles on the sides of our butt are super important for stabilizing us. So we want to do some that are in this frontal plane. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's yeah. see your carry of that. Okay. Come on back face. So she comes back facing the same direction. So she's working the other leg. Okay, so what she did really well is she was swiveling her hips and really getting a lot of range of motion in that leg that was coming around and taking her to the side. But I'm going to pick on her upper body again. <laughs> I don't think I use it much. You don't, no. exactly. So you, so to do your karaoke, you really want to be, you know, nice and, so you're not just swiveling your hips, 
but you're also swiveling your thoracic spine. Okay? Okay. All right, go for it. Okay. Give it a shot. Yep, so arms up. There, better. And come on back. Another one that I really like in that frontal plane are lateral skips. Have we done any lateral skips? I think we've done lateral so skips. for that one, it's really just okay. You know, big swinging range of motion. Okay. One way and then the other. Yeah, and that one's really good. Okay. And that's a good stretch for you. Yeah. So those. So we have the. The A skips and the B skips, which work on the swing phase. We have the butt kicks, which work on the follow through. One I don't think we have done, but I'll show you now so that we can start to include it is called the heel kicks. And that really works on your foot strike beneath your center of mass, okay? Mm -hmm. So I usually have people do is I have them start just um, lifting to the level of the ankle, okay? So the things that you wanna think about are keeping your feet dorsiflex and landing right in front of you. So I'm gonna do a few strides lifting to the ankle, then I'm gonna do lifting to the shin, then I'm gonna do lifting to the knee and see what happens as I increase my range of motion, okay? Okay. So, ankle, What happens? Go faster? Yeah. Yeah. increase my range of motion but it was the same exact drill and that's yeah. how I got more power and okay. a lot more power off the ground so give that a try see what that feels like okay so it's small yeah so as you get bigger you want to keep that yeah better Did you feel that? Yeah. Did you feel like I tried. Here? I tried yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. All right. Making a face. No, no, no oh. I could just tell from your body position. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. So, um, so then we can work a little bit on power. So one thing that I have people do is skip for height. Okay. Yeah, like so I do a regular skip, and you want to try to get as vertical as you can. <laughs> yeah. When you skip. Go okay. All right. So this works on toe off. So see how low, how nicely she's pushing off the ground. But again, you can see her arms aren't really working for her. All right, nice, I heard. strong arms. There you go. Yeah, and you can really, you know, you're if you have a good, stable, powerful arm arm swing. Yeah, that can really help your running power, your running speed. Okay, you know. All right, next one is skipping for distance. Yeah. All right, so this is, she's trying to skip as long as she can with each skip. Try to use my arms. Yeah. Good. So there she's going for distance, not for height. And come on back. So one um, exercise I really like to do, and I incorporate it as a warm up, as a, part of a cool down uh, within a run is called strides and this is um, a an exercise which I'll have Christina demonstrate in a minute where you are starting off stepping quickly but at not with not that much power so at a slow pace and I'm gonna have her go sort of all the way across the field so she will start and then she will accelerate, 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 accelerate. And right as she's at about the midfield, she'll be at top speed, which she will hold for maybe a count of four or five. And then she will decelerate to the end. So it's like a crescendo, decrescendo type of um, feeling. And this is great for stride turnover. It's great for to keep your neuromuscular system sharp. It's a stretch. It has myriad benefits. Mm -hmm. So, so why don't you go down. ahead and jog over and okay. then demonstrate strides. So what we'll hopefully see is she's starting out slowly. 
and then she's getting faster. And then she's about at top speed, which she's gonna hold, and then she's gonna decelerate. And that's a great thing to do. It's not very taxing or tiring, so you can pretty much do it, that sort of thing, every day. A couple of repetitions, you know, two to four repetitions of that. And um, that's okay. You, d you demonstrated it perfectly. <laughs> um, so I really like that as part of a training program, you know, several times a week at least, and in some circumstances every day. Um, and then the last point that I wanted to, and we already touched on this a little bit, is that, um, you know, it's really easy to get in a little bit of strength training after a run, even if it's only five minutes. So I like things like planks. If you want to demonstrate a, a plank and you can either do that. Yep, so forearm plank. Um, and sh she has almost perfect plank position there. Can you show us a side plank? Good. And then a supine plank. So that one, this one's hard. This one yeah. is hard. <laughs> so you lift up from uh, the hips, yeah, I guess. Exactly. Right? Yep. And then, and then side plank the other side. So that is um, like a pedestal routine. So she's, and you can actually lift your hips a little bit if you can. There you go. So those plank series are really good. You can take a rest. Um, good thing to do, um, you know, working up to holding each of those positions for a minute uh, can be very beneficial and you can do those right after a run. You could do them three, three to four times a week. Um, there are a number of hip mobility exercises, which in the interest of time, I think we probably won't go through, but you know, hip strength, hip mobility is really important as well. Um, and so, you know, Look, there are some great resources online. I really like the strength and mobility routines that were created by um, Jay Johnson, who's a coach out of Boulder, Colorado. So I use that those a lot with my runners. But, um, you know, Runner's World has some great routines. New York Times has some great routines. So those would be some resources as well. So do you have any other questions for us? Because I know we're wrapping up. What's the most fun part about running? Uh, I think I don't tell you the feeling afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it, there must be a mental side to it all as well. Yeah, running's my time to honestly, like, do as little thinking as possible. I usually run with my dog. She's really into it, so it's a nice thing we can do together. It's great this time of year. No complaints over here. Well, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Um, any final thoughts? Uh, no, Robert? I mean, I, I wish everyone, you know, good luck and with their fall running goals, whether it's a race or just getting out and enjoying the beautiful weather on all of the trails around here. Um, you'll see me with my cross country team and, uh, and it's just a great time of year to be running. Running is a great way to exercise, burn calories and stay in shape. But it's also smart to be aware of the potential for injuries and how to avoid them. For more about Dr. Breslow, visit her website at RebeccaBresloughMD.com. For the GNAT TV News Project, I'm Andrew McKeever.